PD Mastermind with Adam Forsyth. How's it going, everybody? It's great to be back at Chippy. I, I believe this is my sixth talk at Chippy. It's about one a year since I joined. So, super glad to be back. Uh, yeah, Braintree is hiring. Uh, we even do some Python now if you're into DevOps or data engineering or data analytics, data services. So, feel free to talk to me or Chris Forsman or Ray Berg in the back, one of us who, who work here. If you're also if you're interested in Venmo, also please come talk to me. I know about that also. Yeah, so this talk is called Beating Mastermind, uh, and it's uh, the code and the slides and the speaker notes are all already on my GitHub, uh, which you can see linked, and I'll link again at the end. So Mastermind is a really great game, and this talk is sort of about it, but really it's about sort of being comfortable with algorithms and about how to take an algorithm, uh, an academic paper that describes an algorithm and turn it into code. This is something that maybe you had to do if you have a CS degree or maybe you've done your job, but something that people can be intimidated by. There's really no reason for that. Just like anything else to scale, you use Google to cheat. It's just like everything else. Uh, and I am, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a particular algorithm that's relevant here called Minimax. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Mastermind. It's a, a two-player code-breaking board game, and the picture that you all see right now is exactly what the box I had as a child looked like. Uh, one player is called the Code Maker, and they make up a pattern of colored pegs and keep it hidden. You can see that at the bottom left of that picture. And uh, the other player, the Code Breaker, guesses that pattern and gets feedback in the form of black and white pegs that represent correct and almost correct guesses. And it's actually based, uh, this game itself is about 50 years old, but it's based on a much older pen and paper board game that dates back at least to the 19th century called uh, Bulls and Cows. Um, so here's an example game, and uh, I'm gonna walk you through it. Uh, and the secret pattern is, is off the screen here, hidden at the bottom, uh, and it's hidden until the game is over. And guesses start from the top. So in the first guess here, uh, I've guessed four reds. And I got no colored, or no black and white circles next to it, so uh, that means that there's no reds in the answer. And the second line, I guessed all yellows, and I got two black circles, which means two of those are correct. Um, we still need to figure out which two, though, because uh, because I guessed all four yellows. No two of them are. Uh, you can't tell which two are correct because all four of them are the same color. Jason, do you have a question? Does, does the location of the square, like four correct dots, does that matter? No. No. It, it does not matter uh, where the, the, the sort of feedback circles are placed. Yeah, that, that doesn't tell you anything. Just how many kind of. Uh, so in the third guess, I guess two yellow because I know that's how many there are, and two green. Uh, and the feedback I got was a black circle and a white circle. So the black circle means one of these is correct and it's in the correct position. And the white one means one of these is correct but it's in the wrong position. Now since we already know that there are two yellows exactly in this solution from the previous guess, we know that one of the yellows is correct in the right position, one is correct but in the wrong position, and there are no greens. So I swap the greens out for blues and I move one of the yellows. And I now get three black circles as my response. Since we know that two of those circles have to represent yellows. We know both the yellows are now in the right place. And then additionally, one of the blues is correct color and correct location. But because there's two blues and only one of them is correct, we don't know which one. So the next thing I do is swap out one of the blues for an orange. And my score actually got worse here. I've got two black circles representing the yellows and a white one, meaning the blue is correct, but it's in the wrong place. So I move the blue over to the right and guess the final remaining color, purple, and I get, uh, and I'm done, I've won. Uh, I get four black circles as my response. So yeah, so that's so that I've won there in, in six moves, right? Which is, is pretty good. So the screenshot I just showed you is from an online uh, puzzle game collection called Simon Tathos Puzzle Collection. Uh, and it's, it's really awesome, the games are downloadable, they're playable online, Java was what they were originally written in, they've all been uh, translated to JavaScript as well. There's instructions for all of them. Um, and seeing Mastermind on the site, which on the site is called Guess for copyright reasons, uh, is what inspired this work and this talk. Uh, 
Uh, and I did originally want to include more screenshots of the game, illustrating all the steps of the algorithm. But uh, because I'm giving this talk at conferences where I'm time limited, I did have to cut those out. Cool, so let's talk about the paper. Um, it was written by Donald Booth and published in the Journal of Recreational Mathematics in 1976. Uh, Donald Newth is known as the father of the analysis of algorithms. He created the text typesetting system, and he wrote the art of computer programming, uh, and which is, is like sort of the bible of algorithmic programming. And he gives a solution in this paper that will always win mastermind in five moves or less. And there is a link to the paper on the slide if anyone wants to check it out later. So the problem is that what you see on the screen right now is how he gives the solution. So. Uh, <laughs> It's just a giant lookup table called Figure One, and this actually isn't even the whole thing. This is just the first half. So while it's not, it's actually small enough that you could memorize it if you were, you know, a little bit obsessed and had a good memory. Uh, that's not really what we're going for here. You want to actually understand why it works, but the paper doesn't give code. Um, yeah, if you didn't care, you could probably just type this into the computer and wrap it in a little. Thing that looked things up in it, and you, you, you'd still win if you used your program to play the game, but you wouldn't understand it, which is what we're going for here. So the paper basically has seven parts. Um, these aren't labeled in the paper, but just to break down instruction for you. It starts out describing the game, and then it explains how to use the lookup table, and then walks you through several examples. Uh, and in these examples, instead of using colors, it uses the numbers one to six and the letters B and W instead of black and white pegs, just because it's, it's written in text. And, and the fact that we use numbers for this will be important later. Um, the fourth part is more interesting. It describes an important part of why the algorithm had to pick a certain guess in the example it just gave. And I'm gonna read that, that part for you. Um, incidentally, the fourth move, 1462 in this example, is really a brilliant stroke, a crucial play if a win in five is going to be guaranteed. None of the seven code words which satisfy the first three patterns could be successfully used as the fourth test pattern. A code word which cannot possibly win in four moves is necessary here in order to win in five. So this is saying that sometimes we're gonna to need to guess a combination of colors that we already know is impossible in order to eliminate enough of the remaining potential answers to win in five moves. And I think that's pretty cool, and it's not something you would necessarily uh, think to do intuitively as a human player, but is actually crucial to, to getting that maximum number of moves down to five. Uh, and something I had never like sort of intentionally done as a player until after I read this paper. Um, so and then this is part five, and this is this is the core of the paper. Really, you can sort of just read this part, and I can still give the rest of the talk. Uh, so figure one was found by choosing at every stage a test pattern that minimizes the maximum number of remaining possibilities over all 15 responses by the code maker. If this minimum can be achieved by a valid pattern, making four black hits possible, a valid one should be used. Subject to this condition, the first such test pattern in numeric order was selected. Fortunately, this procedure guarantees a win in five moves. So this is the heart of the paper. It, it's possible to get one of 15 different combinations of black and white pegs as the feedback to your guess, depending on how accurate that guess is. So you want to pick a guess that most reduces the number of possible correct answers left, assuming that the combination of black and white pegs you get back, the feedback, gives you the least amount of information. You want to minimize the maximum number. You want to optimize the worst case. Uh, and the, the uh, emphasis that, is, that you see on the screen or on minimize the maximum number of remaining possibilities, I did not add. That is in the original paper. So, yeah. Is, is this the original source of the minimax? This is not the original source of the minimax algorithm. Um, it, it then, the paper then goes on to describe how to break ties, right? If there are multiple guesses that leave the same number of remaining potential answers, you want to pick the one that is itself possible. But if there isn't one that has the, the minimum number of remaining potential answers left that is possible, then you should still choose it. So 
You just prefer an answer that could itself be correct to one that couldn't be, but you do have to be willing to choose either kind. And if there's still more than one left, which is sometimes true, there's sometimes like a true tie, um, just sort them numerically. So remember, we're representing all of our colors as the numbers one to six, so you just need a tiebreaker, and you just use numeric order as your tiebreaker. So now, of course, we need to figure out how to implement that. So as always, the, the answer is just to type what seem to be the keywords into Google. Now this paper helps you out a lot by using italics exactly once in the entire paper. And so if you did literally just type, you can literally just type maximize minimum into Google, and you'll get the right answer here. But for me, maximize minimum algorithm is sort of what occurred to me as what you would pull from that if you were reading it sort of uh, innocently. Um, but I just want to reassure everyone, if you're a Stack Overflow fan, uh, you can use this and then go to Stack Overflow. You'll, you'll get results that are, that are Stack Overflow answers that will point you in the right direction. But we're actually going to use Wikipedia today, so apologies if you like Stack Overflow. What's the answer by Egypt or Stack Overflow? No, not, I, 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 I've answered a lot of Stack Overflow questions, but T asked, did I answer this one? And the answer is no, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I'm not referring to myself when I say that. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the exact definition of Minimax. It's a little technical and it's not that important, but it, it is really just what was described, minimizing the maximum number of something. And optimizing the worst case. Uh, so just, re and really the Wikipedia article here is a, is a really good summary. That's not always true. Sometimes a Wikipedia article is so technical that it, if you don't already understand it, it really doesn't help you. That's not the case here. Um, if you have just a little math background, this, this page will make sense to you. Um, but we're impatient programmers. We don't want to read this whole thing. So luckily, a word jumped out at me when I saw this table of contents. It says pseudocode. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And doesn't Python pretty much look just like pseudocode? Is that what everyone says? So we're just going to jump right down to section 2.2 and hope it'll point us in the right direction. So this is literally the entire code, and it's pretty short. And that's really promising. Uh, so let's walk through it, and we're going to start right from the top with the function parameters. So function minimax, which takes a node, a depth, and whether or not you're the maximizing player. Uh, so the node is just where we are in the game. What have you done so far? What possibilities have already eliminated? What's our, what was our last guess? And what score did that guess get from the code maker? Uh, the depth is how much further ahead in the game we want to look to try and figure out what guess is best. And uh, if you go back and read part five of the paper, it says to look at which is best based on the possible responses to your next guess by the code maker. So that's only one guess and one response ahead, so our depth is two. So it's very simple. And then the last parameter is just whether we're currently making a move for the minimizing player or the maximizing player. And we'll describe that a little more later. So let's look at the second and third lines. If the depth is zero, or the node is a terminal node, then return the heuristic value of that node. So let's ignore the if the node is a terminal node part, because that we're only looking two moves ahead, and moves always come in pairs, right? There's always a guess and an answer. We don't actually have to worry about uh, the, hitting a terminal node, because there will always be two, two left until we've won. Uh, so if the depth is zero, we've already looked at those two moves ahead, and we need to provide the value for the guess. Um, and so remember from part five of the paper, the heuristic for a score from the code maker for the code maker is the number of possibilities that that leaves. And uh, for the code breaker, for the person who's making guesses, it's that number, which is the number of possibilities it leaves that you got from the other player, whether the guess itself is still possible, right? Because we might prefer a guess that could be the right answer to one that could, but we have to be willing to use either one. And then finally, just sorting numerically. So that's our heuristic. It's, it's really that exact thing that was said in, in two sentences in the paper. Um, yeah. So let's look at the middle part of the function now. Um, so it says, if you're the maximizing player, then do one thing and otherwise do something else. Uh, we're, we're all the code breakers, right? We're trying to solve the puzzle, uh, figure out what the code is. So, and we want to minimize the maximum number, right? So we are the minimizing player. 
Our job is to minimize that maximum. And the code maker who's setting up the puzzle, they want to maximize the number of possibilities left, right? Because they're hoping you don't guess correctly. So they're the maximizing player. Um, so, and so if you look at either one of these, they are pretty much the same, uh, just with uh, just like a, a difference between maximum and minimum. The maximizing player finds the, the max value of recursing one level deeper into the function, of calling the function from itself, and the minimizing player finds the minimum value of recursing one level deeper in the function. Um, so for the maximizing player, we look at all the possible scores and take the maximum one. And for the minimizing player, we do the opposite. We look at all of the maximum uh, number of answers that we could possibly get from the maximizing player, and we want to take the minimum one, take the guess that correlates with having the least number of answers left. So starting from the first call to the function, we first look at each guess that we could possibly make and call the function again. Then for each of the guesses we could make, we look at every score it could possibly get and then for each score it could have, we call the function a third time. And in that third call, we're at depth zero, and we calculate that heuristic value, right? The number of possible remaining answers, whether or not this guess is possible, and the numeric value of the guess. We return out to the previous function, we take the maximum, and then we return out to the very first call of the function and take the minimum, and that is our result. So I know that's a little, a, a lot of describing code, um, without actually running you through it. Uh, but don't worry, you can always come back and look at this part online. Everything's gonna be on my GitHub, and uh, I will go through specific code later. Yeah? What's the value equals negative equal sign or value equal? Yeah, so uh, in this pseudocode, they're only looking at the maximum or minimum of two values at a time. So they're basically only ever comparing two values and taking the max or taking the min. So in the very beginning, you need a starting value to compare. So when you want to take the maximum, you need to start with a value that you know anything will be bigger than, and everything is bigger than negative infinity. So you compare negative infinity to your first value, that other value will always be bigger, and then from then on you're comparing two values to each other and taking whichever one is higher. But and it, for the minimizing player, you're doing the opposite. You're trying to minimize, so you start with positive infinity, and anything you get out of your function will always be less than that. So it's just if you had, if you could only compare two values at a time, then that's what you would do. Now, in Python, the max and min functions can take any number of values, so you don't have to do that because it'll just compare all of them and give you the max or min. So at this point, we've really we've done the hard work, right? We've read the paper and found the description of how it solved the problem. We Googled that and found pseudocode of how to implement that kind of algorithm, which happens really frequently. I know this is a particularly easy case, but that does happen all the time. And, and now we just need to code it. So specifically, I'm going to show an implementation of Mastermind that automatically plays itself against a randomly generated answer. So don't worry if you don't follow every line of the code exactly. You can always download it later and edit it, play with it yourself. Uh, you know, look up in the docs what specific function calls do, that kind of thing. Uh, this code could also be structured better. It's optimized here to sort of make it fit on the slides and be pretty short. I've actually got it down to about 60 lines of code here uh, for the purpose of the talk, but don't take that as a endorsement of structuring the code this way. I originally had written this as part of a larger project to implement a number of sort of guess and check games like this, and so uh, it was originally structured much differently, but used some more advanced Python features like coroutines that aren't appropriate for a talk like this. So uh, yeah, don't structure your code like I am. Um, I, I use a lot of almost global variables. So not quite, but almost. Um, yeah, so first I'm going to show you the basic logic that you need for Mastermind. Uh, when we start a new game, we have to set up a few things. We haven't uh, made any guesses yet, so we, uh, our guess is tracking variable we set to zero. And we pick a random answer from all possible answers, right, which is four numbers from the range one to six, because we have four pegs and we're representing those numbers instead of colors. Uh, we also set up lists of all possible answers and a map, a dictionary, that maps 
all the possible uh, guesses and answer combinations to the score that you would get if that were the guess and that were the answer. And I'll show you that in more detail in a minute, but we basically are gonna need that to look up uh, scores later without having to calculate them every time. So here's the main loop of the game. You can make up to 10 guesses, and we check the guess, is, we make a guess, right? Uh, and then we check, is that guess in the, the list of all possible answers, right? Because if you guess like A, B, C, D, that's not a valid guess, right? It's not the numbers one to six. So we don't want to penalize you because you made a typo, so we just ignore that and start again. Uh, and if the guess is valid, then we add one to the number of guesses you've made, calculate a score for that guess, and I'll go into that in more detail. And then finally, if the score we got was four black pegs, we know that we've won, and so we print out the, the number of guesses it took and what the correct answer was. So uh, something you might notice here, and then we break out of the loop because we're done. So something you might notice here is that uh, I handle winning, but I don't handle losing. That's because this algorithm never loses. You have 10 guesses, this algorithm always wins in five guesses or less. So I don't need to handle that, but I promise when I was originally writing, it, writing this, it did handle losing until I was sure it was right. So don't, if you write something like this yourself, yeah, don't, don't skip handling failure. Make sure that you do that until you're 100% sure the code is correct. Uh, and again, it's for showing on the screen, so cutting out those few lines makes it shorter. Uh, yeah, so here's the function that takes a guess and an answer and calculates a score. So we make three empty lists, one to score the, to store the scores, we build it up. One to score to store the list of uh, pegs and the guess that are wrong, and one to store the list of pegs and the answer that didn't match anything in the guess. So we, we use the zip function, which pairs up a, a, each item from the guess with, with its equivalent item from the answer. So we get a one guess and one answer peg at a time, and then we take another one and another. And um, if the guess peg and answer peg match, that translates to a black feedback peg, score peg. So we append a B to the score. And if, and then if they don't match, then we append them to our wrong lists to use later. Then we go through each wrong peg in either the guess or answer, it doesn't matter which way you do it, and check if there's an equivalent peg in the other side. And if there is, you remove that peg from consideration and append a white peg to the feedback, which means that you had a color that was right, but it was just in the wrong location. So it didn't match on the first pass. So before we actually use the Metamax algorithm, there's some information we need. Um, and it's a little slow to build up this information. We don't want to do it every time we run through the game, because remember, the computer is playing itself, so it's going to play many times. Uh, so instead, we want to do this once in our init method, and then store that data to be used later. Um, because the rest of the algorithm is pretty fast, at least in Python. Um, so first, we need to generate the list of all possible answers, uh, which means all possible combinations of the digits one to six, up to four of them. So just, you know, one, 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 two, et cetera. And intertools.product is a really convenient way to do that. Um, and second, we use that list uh, sort of in a nested loop with itself. We take all the possible guesses and all the possible answers, which are the same list, right? And for each combination of the two, we calculate what score you would get. So when they match, it's gonna be four black pegs. As they match less and less, it's gonna be more and more scores. And this, having this big uh, nested dictionary is gonna help us out later so we can look these up really fast without having to calculate them again. Cool, so finally, the climax. Uh, we're gonna go through the Minimax algorithm and use the heuristic from the paper and implement it in Python. So initially, we're only gonna talk about where we've already made a guess, not the first move. So that's the if self that guesses. If guesses is greater than zero is the effect of that in this program. The zero evaluates as false. Um, so, and if we do have a guess, already made a guess, we're not on the first move, we're gonna look at the list of all possible answers. And if, for the last score we got back, that answer is still possible, we're gonna keep it. But if the last score we got back makes this answer now impossible, we're gonna filter it out of our list of possible answers. So this is really like, this is our celebration line of code, right? This is what we're trying to do, is eliminate possible answers so that we have less and less left until there's only one. Um, 
Yeah, so we, and we also created an empty list that we're going to use to store all, all our heuristic values for our guesses. Um, so this is really dense here. I realize this is a lot of lines that almost are as wide as the slide all at once. So again, don't worry if you don't follow this exactly. You can always download this code and these slides, including my speaker notes, so everything I'm saying right now, uh, are all available on GitHub for after the talk. So uh, for each guess and the list of all the possible scores for each possible answer to that guess, we, we pull those out of our of our deep, our multi-level dictionary, and we filter them. But we uh, we're not filtering the list of guesses. We're just filtering the list of answers. Because remember, sometimes we need to make an impossible guess in order to finish in five moves or less. So on lines two and three here, we're filtering out the answers, but we're still keeping all of the scores, all the guesses that were originally in that array. So, and then we just, we, we, after we filter those scores by answer, we store them right back in the original array uh, under the original guess. So uh, we then calculate the number of possibilities per score. So this is an, another fairly dense line. We take that list of scores grouped uh, by, for by answer, and we look at the values of that function, right? So all of the scores, and we count how many times each different score appears in that list. And so the counter function basically is just counting frequencies. So if the score BBB appears four times, it'll create you a dictionary where the key is BBB and the value is four because it appeared four times. So that's all this line is doing is calculating frequencies. For each score, how many possibilities are there? How many different ways can we get that score? And then it's taking the maximum of those values, right? That's our worst case. If BW could happen 15 different ways, and that 15 is the most different number of ways we could, uh, we could reach a score, that's our worst case, right? Because if we get that score, we still have 15 different solutions that can be left, rather than four if we got BBB. So that's our worst case, is 15. Uh, we then check whether the guess that we're checking is, is itself a possible answer or not, because remember, we need to prefer ones that are possible answers, but accept ones that aren't. And then to our list of possible choices, uh, we append that uh, number of possibilities, whether or not the guesses are possible, and the numeric value of the guess itself, because that's the tiebreaker. Uh, so I know that's a lot, uh, but it is pretty simple. Um, and this does relate directly back to the function, the pseudocode we walked through, right? Our outermost call to the function is iterating through all the guesses and scores by answer. Our, we then go into the function one time and calculate the frequencies, and we go in two times and calculate the heuristic values, the, right, the max frequency, and we come back out and we calculate, and we uh, append those all to a list. And then finally, after all of that, we, we come out of that for loop to our outermost call of the function, and we take the minimum of that list of guesses. And that's the outermost call of the function, our move is the minimizing player, and that negative one there is just pulling the guess back out of the heuristic, right? Because the last item in the heuristic is the, the guess itself, so we can just pull back out of there that guess and return that as the result of our function. Uh, and then, if you remember, this is all if we only if we already made a guess and got a score back, right? Because none of this works if we didn't already make a guess and get a score. We need the score for all of that. So we still need a first move. And what first move is right? Well, it's two of one color and two of another. In this case, we're using one, one, two, two. Uh, and the logic for why that's the best one is totally straightforward. Um, but basically, if you try all the possible first different first moves, this one is all, will always let you, and you just try every combination and try every game for every one of those. If you pick two of one color and two of another, one, one, two, two, you will always win in five moves. And if you pick any other first answer, you won't always win in five moves. So it's the best because it's the best, not because we've used some logic to understand why it's the best one. So it's just purely experimental. Try every possible first answer, 
this one always wins in five moves, some other ones don't. So, um, interestingly enough, like, if you played this a lot, maybe not as a little kid, but like in high school or something, you very well may have figured out that this is the best first move, just by trial and error. Uh, so when I learned how to play this, uh, I, I can't always win in five moves, uh, but I, I did realize that the best first answer was two of one color, two of another, and that's the pattern that I always use to start my games. Uh, cool. Um, and th this is all just explained near the end of the paper. This isn't anything that's, this is one of the easier parts of reading the paper. Um, so that's really it. Uh, you call the play method that I showed at the beginning and the game will play itself. Uh, so I'm gonna run the code for you in a loop and uh, you can see that it takes a few seconds to start up and build up those initial maps of scores and answers and guesses to each other. And then it, it's pretty fast for it to actually play itself and win a game. Uh, and it'll always win at five years or less, which we see. And because this is Chippy, and Chippy is my favorite, I'm gonna show you a special bonus, which is I'm gonna run the program in both Ruby and Python. And you're gonna get to see which one is faster and which one is slower. So can I have you raise your hand if you think Ruby is gonna be faster? Okay, two, three. Okay, well you're wrong, I'm just gonna tell you now. Spoiler uh, alert. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know why you would possibly say that. Um, <laughs> cool. So I am going to start it right now in Ruby. Uh, I think I am at least. Yep, there we go. And then I'm going to start in Python afterwards. Ruby has like a one second head start here. Python on the left, Ruby on the right. Uh, it, it is uh, new, relatively new versions of both. Oh, look at that. Python's already going, and it's winning one game after another in just a few seconds. Five moves, four moves, five moves, four moves, five moves. Wow. Man, Python is way ahead of Ruby. I wonder what's going on. Maybe it's broken. Maybe I made some kind of mistake. I don't know. Oh, look. It took that long just for Ruby to initialize those arrays that you need at the beginning in those dictionaries. Wow. Why was it slow? Oh, look. There, it finally won its first game. And that only took, like, ten times as long as it takes Python to win one. If I keep talking for long enough, maybe it'll even win two games. Oh, look at that. It did. It won two games. Sorry. So that's it. Python is much faster. And I spent more time optimizing the Ruby than I spent optimizing the Python. I'm, I'm much better at Python, so they probably cancels out, but but yeah, so yeah, that's that's my talk. Uh, like I said, everything will be available on on GitHub, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. What's the GitHub URL? I'm trying to show it again. Except I don't know how. Uh, okay, I'm just going to... Obviously the problem space 
grows exponentially. It's actually only, there's only 1,296 possible games of, or possible uh, codes in Mastermind, different potential answers. Uh, and as you increase the number of pegs and the, and the number of colors, that goes up really fast. Um, with a little bit of optimization, this program can handle like significantly more than it does. But uh, yeah, I mean, it grows exponentially. So any, any language you write it in, it's still going to get exponentially slower. Uh, and, and you'd want to just pre-calculate that lookup table and use that. So if you, you mentioned heuristic, right? Is there any heuristic for picking maybe a good starting position or heuristic for kind of pruning the nodes as you're, as you're doing those kind of minimaps? Yeah, is there, is there any way to make the algorithm more efficient to, to use, uh, to prune more potential answers earlier, things like that? Um, so I don't think there is much way to improve this algorithm. I mean, there are optimized minimax implementations, but you fundamentally have to run through all the possibilities. Now, some of the possibilities are actually the same, and this doesn't try to not do, do it twice, basically. Uh, it doesn't care, because it's just twice as fast as in, in a few steps doesn't make a difference here, but um, there's not a lot of speed ups. Now, what there is is that there's different things you can optimize for, right? We optimize the worst case, right? We minimize the maximum. But you could try and optimize the average case instead. So what if you were okay with it sometimes taking six moves instead of five, but instead you wanted the average number of moves it finished in to be lower? And it turns out there are actually other algorithms that have a better average case, but a worse worst case. You have to be willing to sometimes take six moves in order to win in three and four and two more often. Uh, now, I happen to know, because I've tried it, that those algorithms are slower, not faster, uh, and much more code. But yeah, there, there may be different algorithms that are relatively successful. I think um, somebody here at, at Braintree implemented a hill climbing algorithm that I think always won in seven moves or less. As a human player, I can always win in eight moves or less, so that's not that impressive. Five is way more impressive to me. Um, but yeah, there are other algorithms out there. That was a really long answer to that question. Yeah, Joe. As a code creator, are there different patterns that you can use to make it harder for the guests? Like, that's, that's a great question. Um, let's say you know someone's using this algorithm or something. Or what is a harder one to guess? Well, remember that this algorithm sorts numerically. So if you start your, your code with the number six instead of the number one, on average, it's going to take more guesses. Uh, just because that's you've chosen to sort numerically from one to six. Uh, other than that, I don't know of any ways you could make the code harder to guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, there obviously there are some that this algorithm gets in one if it's one one two two, and a lot that it gets in five. So there are some that are better. But if you don't know what algorithm the other person is using, I don't think there's anything you can do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering because. Uh, I'm assuming you didn't like, consistently program any delays in the Ruby version, right? No, no, I'm, I'm glad to show you. No, 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 I, I trust you. Yeah, no, I mean, I can, I can show you. Uh, I'm writing it in Ruby uh, because I'm giving this talk in Ruby next week at RubyConf um, in LA. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, nope, this is the Python version. Um, it's very similar. I mean, I transliterated it and then I just optimized it a couple places because it was really slow. So instead of calculating every guess answer combination, I only calculate, so in Python, I calculate like 1122, 1133, and 1133, 1122, both orderings. I just do the math because it's fast. In Ruby, because it's slow, I only calculate it once and then I store it in both places. Uh, and then I, I do some some set manipulation to avoid copying objects and things like that to try and make the Ruby one faster. But there's nothing in here that's intentionally making it slower. It is the exact same algorithm. I haven't actually profiled it. I don't know why it's so slow. I'm not going to tell anybody that when I give the Ruby conf talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'm wondering about because most of the processing is uh, sort of creating the look of the table from the beginning, I'm just wondering why. Uh, even after the uh, review you finish uh, creating local tables, it's still still slow. Just I'm assuming just doing the min, uh, min max algorithm, right? Yeah, because that shouldn't be so. That shouldn't be so yeah. Slow. Why is the Ruby part slow even after you've done all the hard work at the beginning? Uh, I'm not totally sure. Uh, a lot of it is that in Python, where I'm 
I have a really efficient way to filter that dictionary, mapping answers to scores, using a dictionary comprehension that's available in 2.7 and newer. Uh, in Ruby, I have to do what's highlighted on the screen now. Uh, so it's sort of a regular Ruby block that calls a method inside. And so there's a lot more individual sort of Ruby commands being run internally by the like Ruby VM in this than there are in the equivalent Python code. Because dictionary comprehensions are limited in what you can do and therefore faster. Whereas in Ruby, this is basically a generic Lambda function being passed in to it, you know, and so it's it's not nearly as optimized. Uh, dictionary comprehensions limit the side effects that can happen, so it can optimize the lookups and stuff like that. Ruby can't do that because it's a totally generic function passing, and it can do anything that would have any side effect. You could redefine the function in the middle of itself, all kinds of things like that. So, um, and then Python has that awesome counter uh, type in the standard library, and Ruby doesn't, so I have to take all the values and group them by itself, just meaning like group all the fives together, group all the sixes together. Then I have to take the length of each of those and take the max based on that length. So I have to call length on every one of those lists I just created. And that is how I find what my worst case number of possibilities is. Even, even just looking at whether or not the, uh, the guess is possible is, is a little slower in Ruby. Now, possible answers is a set, so it's a constant time lookup, just like in Python. But then I have to like manually munge it from uh, true or false to zero or one. Because true and false in Python are like literally just one and zero with different names. And in Ruby, true and false are not one and zero with different names. They're different objects and they're not sortable. You can't say true is greater than false. But in Python, you can because it's just one and zero. So there's just lots of little things in here that are slower. I, again, I didn't profile it. I don't actually know which of those is the biggest culprit. But all of those are slower than the equivalent in Python, despite each individual like Ruby opcode being faster than a Python equivalent one. You just run more of them and it's slower. So I don't know why it's so much slower. It's just funny. Yeah. Two more questions. Yeah, true. Yeah, so did they, did they prove that this is the, the best, that this, like, this is the most optimal, like, max, you know, if you're, if you're optimizing this max. Yeah, did, did Nuth uh, prove that this is the best, worst case? Yeah. Yes, he did. And uh, he did not prove it in this paper, but it, it has been proven. Maybe, not by him, but it has been proven at the, like around the same time when this game first became popular in the late 60s, early 70s, that the best worst case is five. Um, it is, you know, he did not optimize for the average case. You can do better than this algorithm for average case, but you can't do better than this algorithm for worst case. All right, last question. Sure. Could you simulate my brother by occasionally making the number of white and black pegs wrong? <laughs> yeah, could you add some randomness to the scores? I remember this being hard uh, when I first learned this as a little kid. Like, I sort of understood when to use which one, but I couldn't quite explain like how you calculated the number of white pegs after you did the number of black pegs. Like, I must have been really little, but yeah. So uh, you could certainly simulate that. I don't know how this algorithm would handle it. It would probably explode, but uh, just for just infinite loop. Uh, but, but yeah, certainly that would be a funny thing to try. And of course, you, that happens when you're first writing the program, and it just runs infinitely, and then you're, you're using Windows subsystem for Linux, which has all sorts of terminal performance problems, and so the buffer runs forever, and you're hitting Control-C frantically, and you just have to leave your computer for 10 minutes to let the file <laughs> Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, everybody.